Thank you for all coming. We, uh, today we have another distinguished speaker, part of our Tuesday seminar series of Biomedical Engineering Institute. Also a uh, co-seminar by our uh, Istanbul Health Industry Cluster and Center for Life Sciences and Technologies. Uh, it is great pleasure to have Savaş Taşoğlu. Uh, he is uh, finished his undergrad degree and PhD from Middle Eastern Technical University in 2006 and UC Berkeley respectively in 2011. Then worked at Harvard Medical School. Uh, he currently returned as part of 2232 uh, Tubitac support program to Koch University and holds managed to hold another adjunct faculty position at Bowditch University and specifically at our institute, Biomedical Engineering Institute. He has uh, five patents, more than 70 articles, uh, many of them in very uh, prestigious journals. It uh, have several awards and many exciting news to share with us. So it's great pleasure uh, to uh, have host him as a speaker in our institute ser series. And I'm sure our institute members and faculty members have joined this uh, seminar to also give a very warm welcome to Professor Tashoglu. Thank you for coming to, uh, to us. Uh, the floor is yours. It's my pleasure. Thank you very much, Cengizan. So my, uh, today, the, um, the, the, the topic that I'm going to cover is uh, magnetophoresis-based technologies for point-of-care diagnosis and uh, complex material fabrication. Uh, so before going into the, uh, the research uh, topic that I'm going to cover, uh, first, I would like to give an overview of uh, our laboratory. Um, so mainly we are working on two um, domains. One of them is diagnostics and the other one is biofabrication. The upper part is showing the uh, diagnostics research that we have been uh, working on and also we recently started to work on. Um, the, so let me use the, uh, the laser pointer as well. Um, the, the magnetic cytometry or magnetic levitation or magnetophoresis based technologies is one of the um, domain that uh, we, we heavily worked on, um, so uh, and also today I'm going to cover that uh, topic. Um, so one of the main applications is sickle cell disease diagnosis. Um, another one is cancer diagnostics and also neutrophil counting inflammation uh, part. Um, as I have been informed that this talk is open to uh, some industrial partners as well, so I would like to also share um, some of the disseminations we 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 did over the years. Um, so these. Uh, these research uh, that I uh, did under the supervision of uh, Utkan Demirci and then later on I uh, did as an independent researcher at UConn and now uh, Koch University and Boazich University. So these, these generated two patents. Uh, one company, I'm not a co-founder, but just uh, these two pi uh, patents licensed uh, by this company and one PhD thesis from my own uh, laboratory. Uh, we published 10 publications, um, mainly first author and senior author. So um, the audience can find more uh, details from this link. Uh, another research topic that uh, we, we, we have been working on is the fertility testing. Um, and uh, we basically had two end applications. One of them was the, um, again, this, uh, the first bullet point uh, from Harvard Research. Uh, this is microchips for um, uh, sperm sorting and uh, uh, for IVF clinics. Uh, and also the uh, second bullet point that came out from my own independent lab at U UConn, which is multi-layer paper-based essays for fertility testing at home. So aiming end users. Um, so this... This actually, a few days ago, um, I got a um, call from my own student um, that um, the, the company we built on this uh, second bullet point um, uh, raised um, um, the, the funding uh, for, for the uh, company we co-founded. Um, so basically these research generated two patents, three company. Um, so all of them are U.S. companies, these two patents licensed by those companies. Uh, one of them I'm a co-founder and also generated a PhD thesis uh, from my lab. Uh, we publish these in four publications and also um, the audience can uh, find uh, further info from the link. The 
third one is urine diagnostics. Um, we mainly, uh, again, we, this is a recent research. We work on this. Uh, we have been working on this since the last year. Um, we collaborated with uh, Aido Anojian from UCLA. Uh, we recently published this uh, research on electrolyte sensing in urine. Um, so a student of mine, again, um, we, a PhD thesis, um, and also uh, we're uh, planning out a company again around this domain. Um, and we have two articles in the review. And the last one is the um, multidrug resistant tuberculosis diagnostics. Uh, this is a new project recently funded, um, basically lamp-based diagnostics using uh, saliva. Uh, we're collaborating with Imperial College uh, funded by uh, Newton Fund. Um, the second domain, big domain that we are working on is biofabrication. Um, so here, this is um, mainly um, uh, um, moving in a direction that we are combining all these uh, legs, uh, which are uh, biofabrication or um, biomaterial or tissue fabrication. Um, so um, I had the privilege to uh, collaborate uh, with uh, Professor Metin City from Imperial College, uh, from uh, Max Planck Institute. Um, so we had a work on that. And then my lab further continued with uh, bioprinting um, due to, uh, again, our interest in um, commercializing or creating actually scalable uh, tissues that may uh, find uh, more convenient applications uh, in the industry. Um, the other domain is microfluidics. So we, we work on several chip designs over the years for various applications. Some of them are like first 3D printed chip uh, uh, gel with gels pattern. We published this with Ali Kodem uh, Now he's at uh, Terasaki. Um, so we also work on some, um, you know, at different levels, like o o studying the formation of oocyte or you know, sorting sperms. Um, and also I had some um, experience in the microfluidics theory, computational uh, fluid dynamics from my master's and from my PhD. Uh, we heavily work on um, elastohydrodynamics and uh, computational fluid dynamics of droplets, droplet impacts with receiving surface, which actually formed the uh, very first model of bioprinting, droplet-based bioprinting in the literature. Um, so now we're interested in combining all these um, you know, legs uh, to create um, high throughput uh, drug testing platforms. Um, so the so far we you know achieved one PhD thesis, uh, several publications, um, and we have been funded by these uh, um, uh, these agencies. And uh, you know, audience can find uh, further information about the research um, in those links. Uh, so today I'm going to talk about point of uh, care uh, sickle cell diagnosis mainly, and also some um, uh, you know um, a minute uh, results of CTC detection and uh, neutrophil um, uh, applications. Uh, and also, if time allows, I'm going to talk about some uh, bottom-up biomaterial fabrication. Um, as I said, this guided microrobotic assembly and bioprinting research uh, we obtained um, we we, um, we study. Um, so what is um, uh, sickle cell disease? Uh, the term sickle cell disease describes a, a group of inherited uh, red blood cell disorders. Uh, people with sickle cell disease have abnormal hemoglobin, uh, called hemoglobin S or um, sickle hemoglobin um, in red blood cells. So normally, uh, as you can see in this um, top right uh, corner, normal red blood cells are flexible cells. Um, on the other hand, uh, abnormal sickle cells are rigid um, and with slightly increased uh, densities, volumetric mass densities. There are also uh, some forms of sickle cell disease like SS uh, or thalassemia um, and uh, other forms. Um, so as I said, normal uh, red blood cells are flexible so they can move through large and small blood vessels uh, to deliver oxygen. Uh, on the other hand, sickle um, cells are not flexible and can stick to uh, vessel walls causing blockage that uh, slows or stops the flow of, blo flow of the blood. Um, and when this happens, oxygen can't reach uh, nearby tissues. Uh, some of the symptoms of anemia um, are, uh, for instance, um, on the, uh, the blood vessels like low blood pressure, 
eyes yellowing, um, muscular uh, weakness in uh, muscles. Um, and this is also common in the um, um, uh, in Turkey as well, especially in the um, I believe Çukurova region in um, in the southern southern part of uh, Turkey. Um, so here uh, we, when we were working on this project, we um, we looked the pro problem. I mean, we we focus on the problem itself and then uh, try to come up with the the solution um, instead of. Um, sometimes in, in these biotechnology laboratories, um, uh, it is actually quite the opposite. You work on a technology and then, um, you know, advancing, um, you know, step by step and then try to find out some applications for that. In our case, we were, um, I was lucky to uh, work with, um, um, uh, with, uh, with the, uh, you know, the, uh, the researchers with uh, the, the other way around mind setting. Um, so we, we said that if the, uh, the skill red blood cells um, are uh, heavier uh, with a, a larger um, a volumetric mass density, uh, then uh, we, uh, we should come up with um, a, a technology that can actually sort out the cells based on the, the volumetric mass densities. And as I said, the, the main uh, justification uh, for that thought was um, so RBCs in people with sickle cell disease have been you know, observed to become dehydrated and increase in uh, density, as I said. Um, and uh, this is mainly due to the, um, the hemoglobin uh, polymerization accompanied by a change in the activity of uh, cation transport systems. Um, and under the, the, exogen the oxygenated conditions, uh, HPS molecules polymerize, polymerize to form long rigid fibers. Um, and causes uh, causing the red blood cells to take on a uh, sickle shape. Um, so as I said, we uh, we uh, we we um, uh, we wanted to um, um, uh, sort the cells based on their volumetric mass densities. Um, and to do that, we first started with um, a very simple um, uh, sensor. Actually, it is uh, it is called magnetic levitation. Magnetic levitation has been out there for a long time. Uh, we know these, um, you know futuristic or, I mean, um, uh, from the, you know, these maglev trains or, uh, you know, some other applications that, uh, you know, use for um, just getting rid of the friction, right? Um, so here in this case, we use um, two permanent magnets in untelmost configuration. That means the same poles facing each other. And then a capillary that goes into these uh, two magnets, um, so that creates the, the optimum environment because um, to be able to cancel out or tune the effects of the volumetric mass density, you're creating basically a homogeneous external field um, that is causing these particles, and in that case, cells, biological, ce biological cells, um, um, uh, move away from these high magnetic field areas which are uh, near the uh, magnets and move towards the center line of this uh, capillary where the magnetic fields uh, is vanished. So in that case, when they are moving towards that direction based on their densities, volumetric mass densities, they're just um, equilibrated at certain heights, just as a function of uh, their volumetric densities. So obviously there's also some drag force in the transition period during the motion, but once they're equilibrated that drag force that track force, fluidic track force is just canceled out and the magnetic force is just balanced by the, the volumetric mass um, density. So here in the first, in the first, in the uh, very first iteration of this technology, we uh, use in combination with a fluorescent microscope. Therefore we, you know, uh, use two mirrors to be able to uh, illuminate the sample uh, from the, if this is a capillary from the uh, cross section. Right, and also here you see uh, some cells that are um, equilibrated and confined um, due to the, this external field, um, and the image is taken from site, um, as I said. And also we know from the literature that um, blood uh, has all these cell types with actual varying uh, uh, volumetric mass densities. Uh, densities. Um, and although there are some overlaps, obviously, between these cell types, 
uh, this can still provide a useful information. And after all, we're just using two simple permanent magnets, right? Labels, um, label free and power free. Um, so this can this can find many applications in pre-screening um, of cells or uh, particles um, um, at the, um, at the, on the site or at the point of care. So here we show that these spike cells, red blood cells, neutrophils, and lymphocytes um, can can accelerate at different heights. And also here we show that uh, when you vary the, uh, actually I forgot to mention that point. So these why these particles or cells are moving from high field strength to low field strength because the surrounding liquid is paramagnetic, so relatively more magnetic or magnetically more sensitive to the uh, to the magnets. Therefore, these uh, particles or cells acting like diamagnetic particles. Um, so, therefore, by using this um, um, uh, this uh, this magnetic liquid that we are using, which is by the way uh, Gadavis, which is an MRI contrast agent, FDA approved MRI contrast agent, that is um, um, you know um, uh, that is used uh, in the uh, MRI before uh, someone gets into MRI, um, so mixed with the blood. Um, so it is F FDA approved uh, contrast agent. So uh, by just changing the concentration of that surrounding liquid's magnetic susceptibility, uh, we are able to tune where these particles can uh, can be equilibrated and also the confinement width of those particles of these cells. Uh, so we have some characterization here. We even show that it can be used for separating um, old and young uh, you know, red blood cells. Um, and also this is time-lapse of this uh, separation and equilibration. And also some uh, modeling here, which I'm not gonna uh, go into details. Um, so this was um, basically uh, under uh, supervision of um, uh, Dr. Demirji. And then um, when I moved to uh, my own lab, um, starting my own lab at UConn, uh, we uh, we were interested in um, extending this uh, research that we published the very first time uh, in advanced materials um, as um, uh, as an uh, le levitation image cytometry with temporal resolution. Then uh, we uh, we uh, wanted to focus on some point of care uh, you know um, applications of this technology um, and. Uh, some of you may be very familiar with the point of care research, but mainly um, in this case, uh, there are certain um, design constraints. So there's limited power, limited technician, human resource, and in some cases, limited hygiene. Um, so in these cases, um, the, uh, the technology has to be adapted, right? If you really find, if you really want to apply your technology for real setting. So you have to be able to satisfy those uh, conditions. So what we did is the very first, um, you know, the, the natural extension of our, our research was combining these, um, you know, uh, power-free sensor with, with, with a cell phone, right? There are many laboratories um, actually who's, you know, who, who, who was pioneered by um, Aydan Ezjan, actually, um, our collaborator um, in another domain, and then um, took many laboratories to um, to get into that domain as well. Uh, so we were one of them, and we wanted to um, use uh, these magnetic sensors uh, with a cell phone. So we designed this um, simple uh, attachable device and um, optimized um, use and optimize a, uh, an, an external lens. Um, obviously, these smartphones has uh, the embedded lens, but it wasn't enough for us. So we integrated a, an external lens and diffuser uh, to be able to image uh, the capillary that goes into uh, this uh, magnetic sensor. Um, and here you can see two images at the beginning, uh, these particles, uh, and these are just plastic beads, not cells uh, in the capillary. Um, and over the you know few minutes, they are just you know confining. They are just moving um, uh, this this um, uh, moving into this height levitation. This uh, called levitation height. Um, so then we also we were interested in the effects of 
Um, so I'm just skipping this part as uh, I show some magnetic characterization in the um, in the other uh, you know the fluorescent imaging part. But we were interested in um, a couple of things. Actually, I I didn't. Um, oh yeah, here. Um, so we we also interested in whether you know there's significant effect of this magnus over long time uh, on the cell phone itself because if you know one use uh, this. A uh, smartphone attachable device for for a long time would it affect or interfere with the inner working of the cell phone? So we wanted to characterize the magnetic field strength, and um, um, and we tested for uh, various uh, elapsed times, and we didn't see any interference or any malfunctioning in the cell phone. Um, and another thing was, uh, you know, uh, whether the thermal accumulation in the cell phone would affect uh, uh, this magnetic liquid that we are using, uh, this cadavis. Uh, so uh, we we collected a couple of temperature data over different locations uh, on cell phone. Um, so we, we run these for various times. Um, and also we didn't see a major difference between, uh, you know, the is an effect in the, uh, in the uh, temperature of the, the cadavis that we are using. Uh, in the um, you know in the capillary, um, another thing that we did was uh, we um, you know I was again lucky to have uh, smart undergraduate students who were uh, from this computer science department and they help us to set up this um, cell phone application to be able to collect images from the cell phone, analyze, so detect where the magnets are. So here, these black parts are actually the magnets. And also where the, the edges of the capillaries, um, and also where these microspheres or cells are located. Um, so we also developed this uh, smartphone application. Then we uh, work with um, uh, Professor Matthew Heaney from um, Boston Children's Hospital um, to be able to uh, get real blood samples um, from sickle uh, patient groups um, and um, uh, run our device. Um, uh, to be able to validate the, 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 the approach for the sickle cell disease. As you can see, uh, these are controlled red blood cells, so presumably healthy people, um, and this is SS uh, red blood cell uh, samples. Uh, as you can see, there's an obvious difference, right? This In the control group, the cells are confined um, much more narrowly, compactly. Uh, on the other hand, in the uh, sickle cell groups, it is in a wider area. So therefore this, this can even you know, provide a naked eye um, you know, diagnosis by a health technician, uh, but it uh, made sense to create a, a, an application to do the image analysis uh, and um, uh, you know, provide some quantitative data. That's what these histograms are actually showing. The, the intensities of these color changes um, across the cross section. Um, then we didn't stop there. Um, so um, the, the reason why we didn't uh, stop this technology at that point was because um, potential difficulties in standardization. Uh, we uh, had different uh, smartphone brands, hardware operating systems. Um, recall we had this external lens uh, right in front of the, you know, the cell phone camera. So if a health technician has a separate, you know, a different, you know, smartphone or brand or, you know, model uh, and operating system even uh, maybe different. Um, so all these can, um, would create uh, standardization issues. Um, so therefore we want to create a self-contained setup. Um, so to be able to do that, again, we use uh, our magnetic sensor. Uh, we, uh, we actually bought a camera uh, but then we ended up um, dismounting the camera uh, and uh, because we wanted to be able to uh, change the focal uh, distance, the, the, uh, the distance between the lens and the receiver. Uh, so we created this uh, focusing ring here. Um, it's a mechanical ring, but it's just changing the, uh, the location of the lens. Um, and also we, you know, an LED screen, an Arduino, and uh, all these, uh, you know, uh, embedded electronics. So this uh, actually a handheld device. And uh, we didn't forget to put our names on it as well. Um, so here, 
Uh, so again, this is the cross section of the uh, the capillary, uh, the forces that are applying on the uh, you know these cells, uh, and this shows the workflow, right? So we're using this um, uh, finger prick blood, and then we're mixing with the uh, the Godavist, um, the the uh, the MRI contrast agent, and then that goes into this small um, um, you know uh, reservoir location to be able to get image um, and uh, analyze the image, right? So this is showing some inner um, structures. As I said, there's a lens, there's a uh, focusing ring that the user can control. Um, and that's it. So this is the user interface. So we, uh, you know, assign some roles to these, uh, you know, buttons. Um, so basically zoom in gets a single measurement or time-lapse measurement. Um, so some charger port. So the device can be still use um, can be still connected to a cell phone just to trans just to transmit the data, but that wouldn't be affected by uh, the brand or you know the model of the, the smartphone, right? Uh, because um, you know just just to you know um, the the smart the self-contained device can be used for all this analyze running the. Uh, you know the sample separating and then getting the images and getting some quantified quantified data and then a smartphone can be connected by a health technician to send uh, the data to somewhere else right that's why we have all these uh, you know ports and connections so we published this um, this research uh, this self-contained setup in advanced materials technologies in two different publications one just the development of the setup and the second one is the uh, on the sickle cell disease and the smartphone uh, setup uh, was also published in um, scientific reports and plus one. Um, so these are showing again some time lapse images. So uh, for two concentrations, we actually run this for a larger um, you know, concentration range. Uh, but basically, the you know, without knowing the the physics behind. So at the beginning, what we're seeing is particles are just randomly distributed, and then um, uh, as time progress, these particles under the uh, effect of magnetic forces are just confining. And in this case, there's only one type of particle with the same density. Um, uh, but there can be many particles with different densities, right? In that case, we can, uh, if we can, you know, uh, tune the, uh, the, the concentration uh, of this uh, surrounding liquid, um, then we can uh, we may be able to you know separate these particles. Um, so these are uh, actually yeah, this is additional data. Here we showed also the um, shelf life shelf time of the you know the, the results as well uh, because obviously in the resource you know the, in the real life application uh, the samples or the you know the data views can wait for uh, longer times. Um, so we want to show that for different um, uh, you know this transportation time or the uh, you know the uh, the, uh, the um, you know the shelf time of uh, good is, is there any significant effect so we also studied uh, this um, and again um, as an end application uh, with real um, blood samples we again work with uh, professor Heaney from Boston Children's Hospital um, so um, uh, again here uh, you can see the confinement width for control group uh, and uh, sickle um, you know, patients. Uh, and this is, uh, I have to clarify that this is the worst case scenario. We are studying actually the worst case scenario because these uh, patients um, have been already diagnosed with sickle cell disease. We are talking about Boston area, Longwood, uh, Boston area. So uh, these patients are have, have already been diagnosed as diagnosed with sickle cell disease and there um, many of them are under this uh, transfusion uh, treatment so that means that they're visiting the hospital getting blood transfusion um, and we're uh, getting their samples at some random locations right we um, the, the, we didn't want to run, uh, apply for another IRB and um, you know constraints uh, the the uh, limit the the uh, this uh, time between the transfusion and the sample collection um, mainly because of the inconveniences the 
um, uh, we instead we said uh, let's work for the uh, worst case scenario uh, because in this case some of these samples uh, came from patients uh, potentially you know after getting uh, transfusion two weeks ago. In that case, when you get the transfusion, um, you may not have a lot of sickle uh, red blood cells. So uh, therefore this uh, large standard deviation um, would be much, much smaller if you run this device in say Sub-Saharan Africa. So if there are many undiagnosed patients, okay? Um, but in this case, uh, um, although these patients are receiving uh, transfusion, which is counteracting what we are trying to do, um, we can still, uh, with, although with a uh, large standard deviation, uh, we can still diagnose these patients. I mean, we can validate the device uh, because the confinement width of the control is much, much smaller compared to uh, these patients. We also define uh, a sickle scale and separation, and we show that now, this is just a function of the confinement width and the levitation height. Um, you can have a look at uh, how we, you know, um, you know, define that function in this uh, in this article. So uh, another application is, uh, you know, uh, separating, um, you know, cancer cells from um, uh, from other cell types. Here we show that uh, I believe this was breast cancer uh, cell um, from lymphocytes and neutrophils. Um, we also um, uh, you know, label these um, uh, cancer cells to be able to validate that. Those are the, the cancer cells, right? And also some of the other applications are uh, neutrophils. So the, the, the approach is uh, suitable for separating activated neutrophils from the resting neutrophils. So activated uh, can be a sign of uh, inflammation in the body. Um, we also uh, show that um, uh, these GCH treated neutrophils can come back to the um, uh, basically treating. So it's a um, uh, reactive oxygen species uh, scavenger. Um, so it can come back to the uh, resting neutrophil area. Um, so it shows that actually you can uh, uh, you're you're able to separate um, uh, the the resting neutrophils from the activated neutrophils. We also show that. So we were again. I was lucky to work with um, a cell biologist from uh, Beth Israel Hospital um, here in Tajiran. Uh, so we work on these cool applications of molecular, um, uh, you know, cell biology. Cell biology actually. Um, so uh, for instance, another thing that we studied uh, was the phagocytosis of uh, Salmonella. So these, um, you know, uh, red ones are showing that these. Uh, salmonellas uh, are eaten uh, were eaten by uh, uh, you know the uh, white blood cells um, and we're separating uh, from the resting ones. Um, so so these were the um, the, uh, the the um, um, the the applications that I, I wanted to cover uh, within this talk uh, in the domain of the point of care diagnosis. As I said, we are you know uh, in uh, some of the remaining research um, is now uh, a bit under uh, you know patent control, uh, especially this fertility testing. Um, and another one is just we just started, um, so I don't have any research results uh, to to share. Um, but um, so how am I doing with the time? We have uh, fifteen twenty minutes. Easy. Fifteen. No problem. Time. Okay, um, so I'm gonna I'm gonna continue with the bio, bottom up biomaterial fabrication. Um, so, so again, um, so you may have some tissue engineering background, so these may be familiar, but um, just for the uh, you know rest of the audience, uh, in general, um, the number of donors and um, transplants, uh, organ donors and transplants are just flat. On the other hand, the waiting lists are going up. So. Um, uh, the conventional approach to be able to you know, address this ultimate goal, although we are very far from there, is uh, seeding cells on top of uh, these pre-shaped um, scaffolds uh, with a combination of uh, molecular and actually mechanical, mechanical and chemical cues. Um, so this is called top-down tissue engineering uh, approach. 
Um, but the, there are some uh, main limitations. Um, some of them are, you know, achieving complex 3D um, cellular architecture and organization um, and control over uh, cellular uh, proximity uh, and microscale resolution. Because basically you have this scaffold and seeding cells, right? And then you expect cells uh, to follow these cues, which are, um, you can consider as some uh, active agents uh, with sometimes a gradients of those agents and the cells are expected to um, move in those directions in 3D. Uh, but in many cases, they are not following uh, exactly the, uh, the target um, you know, directions uh, at the uh, required density of cells. Um, so therefore, uh, there has been this growing um, interest in um, working on the opposite direction which is instead of top down going bottom up. So that is, you can consider this as, um, um, so uh, I'm sure all of us are familiar with uh, Lego. Um, so basically we have all these uh, building structures and uh, we combine them in 3D architecture uh, to be able to create this 3D shape, right? And bottom up changing is exactly trying to do the same. Uh, so we are first creating these bottom-up uh, building blocks, first create, trying to create building blocks, and then applying uh, some external fields. It can be magnetics, you know, acoustics, or some you know, uh, surface interactions like uh, surface tension forces um, to be able to combine all these uh, building blocks into 3D uh, architectures. Um, so although some of these may not apply to each uh, you know, technology, but often these uh, technologies offer precision, um, low cost in some cases, and also it can alternate between cell types in X, Y, Z directions because you're um, directly involved uh, in the motion of these building blocks, right? Unlike the top-down approach. In the top-down approach, you expect um, the cells to follow these cues, right? Um, so there, there has been growing, um, you know, uh, cool applications in this domain, not just in tissue engineering, but also like in energy research. Uh, for instance, Lewis, Lewis Group from Harvard um, uh, created these 3D micro battery or in uh, soft robotics. Uh, there's also some uh, nice applications. Um, and also just, just to um, combine this, um, uh, actually um, just to tie this, Bioprinting is also another bottom-up uh, tissue engineering, right? In that case, you're using uh, the inertia of the droplets or um, in the droplet-based bioprinting, or you're using uh, this shear um, uh, flow um, to be able to extrude filaments um, in uh, 3D, um, uh, you know, in 3D dim dimension. Uh, so that's also a bottom-up tissue engineering, which I'm gonna uh, cover in the next slides. So, Again, so I was uh, privileged to work with uh, Professor Metin City from Max uh, Planck and his student. So basically uh, we want to um, apply their expertise in robotics uh, for bottom-up tissue engineering. Uh, so you see this um, uh, nice um, eight um, electromagnetic coil, uh, which controls this little uh, micro robot which is uh, a, a permanent magnet actually. It's just this, um, a resin with super paramagnetic particles embedded. So you can consider this as a small permanent magnet. Um, so the idea here is by using um, the magnetic fields and controlling the magnetic fields, uh, moving uh, this uh, little magnet as like a, a factory worker, like a small micro factory, moving this magnet or micro robot and push all these prefabricated tissue blocks into 3D architecture. So I, I, uh, I know it sounds um, uh, 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 challenging, but that, that was the main idea. So to be able to create these prefabricated tissues, uh, what we uh, do, what we uh, use was uh, UV lithography, uh, so uh, photolithography, um, um, and uh, photo cross thinking, these cell encapsulating uh, precursor gel precursor. So um, and then using a UV mask that you can you know play with. You can uh, you know uh, 
uh, fabricate any shape of you know cell uh, building blocks. So these are um, after this uh, UV cross sinking. These are just uh, gel blocks in any shape that you can uh, generate, right? So here, for instance, we generated L shape, or it can be uh, in any shape. Um, so this is a short video um, by using this micro robot, which is the 32 times accelerated. This black uh, piece is the micro robot controlled by the user with a joystick. And these uh, building blocks are just gels without any cells in this case. And we're just moving them um, and trying to create these complex architectures. And in the next uh, slides, I'm gonna show some also uh, gel blocks that are um, uh, encapsulating cells. Um, so, um, so we shouldn't just, um, you know, highlight the, um, you know, the advantages of this technology, but also the some, um, you know, um, uh, some limitations. I would say of this technology. Uh, so basically, it allows you to create these three D uh, tissue architectures with um, uh, with um, nice control in the spatial resolution. But on the other hand, it is difficult to create scalable tissues. To be able to do that, one can use um, obviously uh, multiple robots um, that can work in parallel. Um, but um, there are also the 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 the, uh, the uh, um, you know stick stickness of these gel blocks among each other um, has to be uh, also resolved uh, in some cases. Um, so uh, these are some 2D assemblies that we achieved. Um, so this was pu published in Nature Communications, um, and also some 3D assemblies. In this case, we um, move these gels into a reservoir and then uh, put some gels. So we we achieved also 3D assembly. So we basically use uh, these reservoirs to be able to to be able to first uh, park these gel blocks, and then on top of that layer, we also uh, park new uh, or move uh, new, um, you know, building blocks on top of that layer. So the, the, this is just proof of concept. It may not seem as um, a direct application of the uh, a direct ex extension for a nice biomedical or clinical application, uh, but this was the very first uh, work in the literature that was showing the use of uh, micro robotics. Uh, for uh, bottom-up um, uh, complex biomaterial fabrication. We also show some uh, rigid structures and, uh, you know, soft structures together, uh, like the bottom part of this uh, uh, this figure where we put um, like spheres or cylinders um, right next to, next to these gel blocks. So, as I said, in the future extension of this work, one potentially can use multiple robots, for instance, um, not just for tissue changing, but also some um, potential electrochemical detection where you may need to use uh, both rigid structures and also uh, soft st structures um, in a sensor. Um, but this was the proof of concept study, right? Um, so uh, here you can see some uh, assembled cell encapsulating gel blocks, which will let me do this. Um, so, uh, and here we show that um, so we did run uh, these uh, live that uh, assays uh, to be able to show the uh, the uh, whether the cells are live within the, within these gel blocks. Uh, so the uh, so the the novel piece here um, was uh, we already know that by many groups you know out there uh, using these. Um, so again, I'm sorry for the inconvenience. Uh, but basically, um, after um, you, know, uh, uh, you know finishing this uh, micro robotic approach that uh, I briefly showed um, uh, in my own laboratory um, at Yukon, we uh, started to focus on bioprinting approach. Uh, and for that purpose, um, as we are engineers, mechanical engineer background uh, mostly, uh, we uh, we develop our own bioprinter setup fully custom made bioprinter starting from its uh, syringe pumps to all the controlling units. Uh, we published that in um, bioprinting journal um, led by uh, Antonio Atala from, um, what was his university? 
Um, anyway, so we published there, uh, our work um, there. Uh, the main reason why we moved from uh, this micro robotic to bioprinting uh, was because we were uh, interested in uh, creating more scalable tissues and um, um, also finding, uh, focusing on more clinical applications rather than creating these niche uh, small, um, uh, you know, structures, uh, which is uh, beautiful science, but we were more interested in um, uh, scalable uh, clinical applications. Uh, so you can find the, uh, our bioprinting work again from um, our lab or uh, Google Scholar. Um, but uh, just to wrap up, um, using this bioprinting and also microfluidic technologies, now we're focusing on, um, as I said, a clinical application um, which is high throughput drug testing on uh, disease on a chip model. So to be able to do that, you're going to create microfluidic um, uh, chip um, and also use this bioprinting to be able to create the tissues within chambers uh, to test uh, certain drug molecules on actually glioma model, so brain cancer model. All right. Um, so okay, this, excellent. Thank you very much. I hear also uh, thank you, many thank you comments from the chat window. Duygu Hoca wants to find out your collaborator's name at Imperial College. She is from Imperial College, as far as I know. You can ask, I mean, you can definitely find you in private. Uh, uh, if there are questions, uh, let uh, you can ask. Uh, we can continue to finish the official version now or for question and answers. I'm Hoping, Savaş Hocam, do you have a couple of minutes for a few questions that students want to hang around? Yes. Okay, yes. excellent. Uh, I'll start with the uh, with question about this uh, magnetically navigated particles. The size were around the millimeters or so. With the, with the advances in bioprinting, that much higher resolution and precision could be... Uh, achieved, I presume. So do you still see a, a like a, a application which requires this uh, magnetically navigated robotic guided assembly so, uh, finding uh, a place with, because th this printing, 3D printing, bioprinting is going very fast. So Yes. Um, so again, this is my own view, obviously. Um, but um, I think, um, 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 so also this why partially we moved away from um, uh, uh, the robotic approach to bioprinting um, was because uh, we're more interested in the uh, the fabrication and the the resulting uh, structures and uh, Jing is on Ojam you're right so the uh, current bioprinting technologies are also able to um, um, reach to uh, very low resolutions in hybrid. Uh, modes like, for instance, using droplet based um, uh, jetting technology, uh, inertial uh, technology uh, to, you know, uh, deposit small, um, uh, you know, cell encapsulating droplets if uh, the user isn't interested in resolution. And also extrusion uh, in the same setup. Actually, that was our uh, own work as well. We, we showed that a combination of droplet based and extrusion based setup. Um, so extrusion is better for scalable. Um, so increasing the, uh, the, the high throughput um, or the, the scalable fabrication. Um, but um, the, the obviously micro robotics is, is a huge field and I'm not um, uh, an expert in that domain, but I know for instance, uh, Steve is one of um, students who was very successful, started in actually um, in, um, uh, in Boazici. Um, uh, Mehmet Hoja, um, uh, and I think there are some nice uh, applications in other fields. And I think he's also working in, um, uh, I believe, the transport of uh, right. his, his uh, de de delivery of these, uh, uh, you know, the, the delivery vehicles um, uh, with the application of these magnetic uh, robotics or magnetic fields. Um, um, in vivo. So there's obviously uh, there's some uh, nice uh, other applications, but I believe in biofabrication, creating bio tissues, um, bioprinting has some advantages. Okay. Uh, 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 Said uh, wants to start asking questions here. Uh, he has 
apparently many, many questions. He might, might maybe find you with emails later. Said, you want to ask the, start your questions here? And then Ali Riza, you're next. Said, go ahead. A quick questions here. Yeah, okay. Thank you for your uh, great presentation. Uh, I'm actually keen on uh, bone bioprinting. Uh, therefore, I'd like to ask, uh, do you have any studies in bi bone bioprinting? Okay. No, we don't. But we are interested in uh, finding applications in collaboration with other groups. So I should also tell that. Um, so I'm very open to collaborations. Uh, for instance, this you know uh, magneto magnetic levitation work. So if you're a you know molecular cell biologist, there are many applications. So we will be happy to collaborate with you. Um, same goes with bioprinting as well. We didn't work on, on a bone application, uh, but we will we will be happy to collaborate. Yeah, very interesting topic. Maybe uh, you, can, you guys can chat a little bit more. And I know many of our faculty members work on bone um, integration, at least biomaterials and bone integration. So that's a very fascinating topic and many needs as well. Uh, Alriza, you're next for questions. Uh, thank you for your presentation. I go quick. Uh, for the magnetic levitation instrument you showed us, I want to know what would happen if you put it in uh, horizontally, not vertically. Because uh, then uh, the only factor here is the shape and the magnetic susceptibility. But in the vertical, also you have another factor of gravity. Interesting. So okay. it, yeah. So in the actually uh, configuration, we are putting horizontal, right? We have two magnets. Right, and the, the capillary goes um, horizontal. Um, but I assume you meant um, the particles are sorting in the uh, vertical direction. No, 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 sorry, uh, I asked this bad. Uh, imagine you have the end pole of your magnet, uh, mm -hmm. you here. Uh, mm -hmm. Ah, oh, okay. Yes. Sorry. Um, imagine you have your north pole of your magnetic here and the, another north pole here, so and you of put it pole? here. Yeah, I yeah. say we sh you should. You can put it this way. Yeah. So in that case, so uh, the physics change entirely, right? In the vertical direction, you would have the the um, Beyoncé force, right? In the vertical direction, and your man magnetic force would be in the horizontal direction, right? Um, so, I mean, what, what is the, so you, you wouldn't be able to sort the cells, right? I mean, so the, the, all of these particles, depending on their buoyancy, uh, whether they will, um, you know, sink, so come to the top of the capillary or they will, uh, sorry, sink uh, to, to the bottom of the, the capillary or they will just float, right, at the top of the capillary. <laughs> okay, because I thought that uh, because the geometry of them are uh, are uh, different to each other, mm -hmm. so uh, this way you can sort them only based on the effect of the magnetic field on mm -hmm. the different geometries. Thank you for the uh, answer. Um, so you wouldn't be able to separate the particles um, based on volumetric best densities in that case. Um, and what you would, uh, you know, consider that kind of you know configuration would be if you have two sets of particles with different magnetic susceptibilities in that case you may be able to you know achieve separation right other than that if their susceptibilities are same magnetic susceptibilities are same then you're not going to see any uh, separation right um, so um, but if your particles have different shapes, magnet, you know, the sizes are different, then I would suggest you to work on with inertial focusing. Um, so inertial focusing is a beautiful method um, developed by uh, Mehmet Toner and Dino Di Carlo uh, from UCLA. Um, so Di Carlo was actually working with Mehmet Toner at the time uh, when they developed the technology. And now um, they have, you know, show that um, you know, technology for numerous applications, separating particles based on their uh, inertia uh, due to the, the different sizes. Um, and also we are actually collaborating with uh, one of his students, he is now in uh, you know, Korea University Associate Professor there, Aram Chung. 
Um, so he's also very successful. Um, so we, I didn't list that project, but we submitted a, a Korea Turkey, uh, you know, um, collaboration project. So yeah, but just answer, you know, inertial focusing would be um, uh, the best fit for your kind of application. Thank you. It, uh, I might. Uh, I have few questions about these uh, POC devices. Uh, it, Seems to be you you published first ones around 2015, and it seems to be the field is has so many possibilities, and research side is going very fast as far as I can see. Many many promises as a point of view, Karen. It, it is it is becoming more and more relevant with this in this pandemic conditions, but there seems to be a lack of translation or industrial or in routine clinical uh, widespread use. Where do you see some, uh, do you think, why, it, why is it? And are there any low hanging fruits that you can encourage students to explore in terms of uh, here in Turkey or any advices for, seems to be a nice target for our biomedical engineering students. That, therefore, could you a little bit elaborate yeah. more on that? So I, I'm smiling because um, so encouraging them in certain directions may make come against me as uh, you know <laughs> com competing companies. We're also yeah. Bl looking bl for blame me, blame me. I'm, it's, I'm fine. I take the I blame for everything. That, that will be that will be fun either. So I'm just I'm just jo joking. Um, but um, so so I, I came to Turkey a year ago. Um, so I was in US for 13 years. Um, so I'm also new to the setting here. Um, so a, a, a mistake that uh, many bio bio researchers, biotechnology researchers, uh, to be specific, um, um, uh, they they we, we often um, uh, think that you know this um, this sophisticated technology that we have been working on for long years um, 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 can be commercialized just because we're you know, we have been working on it for a long time and it's very sophisticated and that's not the case. Uh, so I, I, I learned this from, a, uh, you know, with hard experiences, um, tough experiences uh, over the years. Um, so first of all, I suggest um, identifying what is needed, what is the main problem, and then tailor your engineering skills towards addressing that uh, instead of the opposite direction. Right, I have this technology. So, what is what is its applications? Um, so, you might have um, work on. So, I, I uh, so there are, there may be also you know new assistant professors in the audience. So, I'm a couple of years ahead of them. So, I so I started as assistant professor in 2014. So, just sharing my experience. Uh, so, you might have some uh, experience uh, in certain technology, uh, but uh, you shouldn't just um, you know, stuck with, with that technology, just identify the problem and go that in that direction. Same goes with the students as well. If you're working with a PI um, or about to start a position um, as a PhD student, I mean, your your PI may have, you know, certain technologies, but just question whether that is needed if you're, you know, asked to pursue some commercialization aspects, right? Okay. I mean, that's good for everyone both for your PI and your yourself. So, um, so asking the correct questions is important. Um, so about the specific topics that they may, um, you know, continue. So, yeah, so my, my experience is limited as well in Turkey setting. So I'm also in a stage, uh, what is, what will be needed? Needed around here, right. And you, some of the things that you also want to uh, explore some academic spin-off and tra uh, translational research into several applications here in Turkey as well. Yeah, but uh, I had few meetings with uh, different um, you know, uh, companies as well. For instance, I met with the uh, Asasan a few times. They are interested in um, you know, glucose monitoring. They're interested in, um, what was the second topic that- Infection, the, maybe? Uh, not the infections, but um, uh, so I, I couldn't remember. But uh, the but uh, so the, the, obviously Turkey setting is different. So we also should 
understand that there are many technologies here that are, um, you know, obviously, obviously uh, what is it, the word imported from other countries. So, and also in this setting now, uh, many established companies are interested in actually replacing these important products with, with relatively less novelty in terms of technology, but just address um, the competitive advantage here, right? The labor costs are smaller here. So the exchange rates are high. So, I mean, obviously if you have uh, a very novel technology that can compete uh, in terms of, you know, technology with, uh, you know, all the companies out there uh, in the world, then that's also good to, to follow up. But um, that doesn't have to be necessarily true for, you know, every uh, story right here. In many cases, uh, it will be even a very successful entrepreneurship if you can, you know, replace replace a technology imported from other countries and uh, uh, creating that technology uh, with some, um, you know, relatively less uh, novelty um, um, using the competitive advantage here, which is labor costs, right? Or, um, or, or smart, gra smart graduate students. Yeah, we, we have a lot of them. So I have to say that. So um, I think... Um, or undergrad. Undergrad. So, um, there are many, sorry. many things I've been used to explore. That, uh, I mean, I have asked uh, whether anybody has a few more questions on the chat. There might be people showing up, but let me ask you something. I, while I find you, let me ask my question about this. Some of these tech, point of care technologies could be adaptable to uh, online blood mo monitoring or real time blood monitoring systems, which is sometimes very critical. Uh, they, those are also uh, actually disruptive technologies where you can just bypass, uh, get routine samples or have it sometime in line or real-time monitoring of, I don't know, some changes on erythrocyte, on leukocyte or something. Uh, some of, most of the technologies that you've shown are more like uh, you take a sample, put it and do lots of processing, even put some markers in there. Uh, have you worked on it or have you, do you have any thoughts about uh, some of these yes. uh, can be adapted to like intensive care settings or just continuous monitoring of drug responses or sepsis or some other additional things? So yes, uh, the, the, especially the magnetic levitation work that we um, studied with Utkan Demirci and then independently of my own lab, um, so that has many uh, actually uh, blood relevant applications. So th aside from those, um, Utkan's group show, uh, for instance, um, uh, you know, bacteria applications, um, um, Ionita Jiran, um, you know, from Beth Israel show actually uh, sepsis application um, uh, using magnetic levitation. Um, but um, so in terms of, you know, translation of that, that technology, um, so, uh, so I'm on the, on the patents. Uh, we actually competed with Utkan uh, by separating, by, um, you know, creating different companies uh, at Yukon. Uh, so we, uh, we competed uh, on the same patent that we, we were on the, um, uh, we were on the patent, um, but we lost uh, the uh, licensing. To their company, uh, which, is, which, is, which is okay, which is okay. So we, I, this is uh, you know fun actually, uh, but we were both inventors, so they they, they are not successful uh, um, continuing their company, uh, which is Levitas Bio. Um, so uh, they received, they raised, as far as I uh, know, uh, last time I checked, eight million dollars, um, and they are now working on many op applications of. Um, you know, commercial applications of this technology. Uh, so I'm not pursuing any, uh, you know, commercialization of the, uh, you know, magnetic levitation. Uh, we, we tried for two years, we worked on it, I on see. a business plan, etc. cetera. But uh, I'm more focused on uh, some other technologies now um, uh, from my own lab, uh, like this, you know, fertility testing, which is, uh, which, which is successful at the moment. Um, so we raise funds um, um, and now we are looking for new applications. Good. I'm, 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 
I hope we will have that problem soon, that we will have like joint patents with students and several faculty members. Everyone what, what wants to explore <laughs> commercial, commercially those patents and we will have like bidding wars at the exactly. university level and yeah. we will uh, or have exclusive, non-exclusive licensing to either one or to both and we will like putting investors fighting yeah. among us. <laughs> that will be, I guess, a milestone for us. Currently, we try to set these things up. I mean, the routine things at the university level. I will, uh, we will discuss that among non-recorded sessions. I presume. Sure. But sure. Overall, it's a good experience. I, 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 I uh, honestly feel proud of that technology. I'm, you know, uh, and uh, so I'm happy that you know that that is going in the dire direction of translation. Um, and it's a good experience. We work on for two years. Uh, it was called Embiotics. Uh, we work on two years. We started the company, uh, and uh, then we dissolved the company. And um, and after that point, we we pursued with uh, you know other options. And it was nice experience learning the you know the, all these paperwork and process. Uh, 